episode 11, Dr. Pat Davidson. Welcome to the Oxidative Potential Podcast, where we discuss all things sports science and performance. I'm your host, Matthew DeRoche, and with me is my fellow co-host, Phil Patterson. Enjoy. Good day, folks. In today's episode, I speak with Dr. Pat Davidson. Um, this is an absolutely amazing conversation uh, with Pat. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I had a lot of takeaways from it. Um, Pat is a wealth of knowledge. He's spent a long time in this field. He has a PhD in exercise physiology. He's been a professor for Springfield College and Brooklyn College. He's trained world-class uh, strongman athletes. He was a strongman athlete himself who's competed at a very high level. Um, he was also an MMA fighter, which we started off discussing um, in this podcast. But for those not interested in MMA, those in the endurance sport realm or wherever, um, we only discuss it for about five minutes, but it's it's quite enlightening. It's, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, so... I think that um, anyone will, will really take a lot out of this episode if, if, you, if you listen carefully. Um, this is a lot of hard-earned knowledge from Pat. I think a lot of the stuff that he's talking about and structuring and organizing these frameworks in your mind, I think, is, is, really, uh, is, is really good takeaways um, for anyone listening. So I'll leave all the links for Pat um, in the description it's basically just one link from his instagram and you can get to everything like his books his education seminars all that stuff through his link tree and in instagram so that will be um in the description and uh our uh the opp podcast all that stuff will be in there as well all our information so i hope you enjoy this episode and we'll catch you later so we were, we were just talking a little bit about MMA and, and submission wrestling. One thing that I've noticed is, because um, I'll get to this about you you and your book and, and some of the stuff that you're doing in the industry now, is there's certain guys that, like we were just talking, you know, some people can submit people that for ex submissions that don't even exist. They're not, they're not created. They just find a way. And one thing I got into, I train with some of these Russian dudes and they're like biomechanics is biomechanics the arm bends one way and it stops at a certain point and it changed my whole perspective on jujitsu whereas now i you know and after that point i looked at jujitsu as this biomechanics model and trying to figure out okay i can actually gain some leverage here on this person because the arm only bends one way if i control this limb and it bends one way there's a lot more options than just the arm bar, just this specific type of, you know, arm bar from guard, it opens up the game uh, dramatically, whether it's with the wrist, with the feet. Um, I think we've seen that now with all the people, foot locks and stuff. But what I'm trying to get into with this is, um, you know, people that do something very specific and simple, whether it's trying to understand biomechanics, you've kind of taken that to the extreme with your book uh you know coach coach's guide for optimized movement like you've taken the very simple um approach which is not easy of breaking down the human body and saying this is this is what you have to work with these are the things you're going to need if you want to enhance your ability to do these other movements down the road if you can't do these basic things at a basic level we shouldn't be progressing from here. And you've done a good job of that. The man that's, that's practiced the, the one kick 10,000 times. And I think that's why so many people are gaining um, so much from your book and the work that you're putting out is because they're like, Oh shit, we've been getting way ahead of the curve here. We've been putting too many steps in front. So um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. What, why did you, why did you come to that point of reverting everything back down to this very um, I don't want to, insult by saying simple model but it is a very a very basic model that holds a lot of value yeah oh you brought me back to the day when i was being coached in mixed martial arts with uh what you were saying some of those russian guys would say because my my coach 
you know, he was, he's just a scary, tough dude, you know, like, uh, yeah. but he, he'd always say like, there's only so many ways you can break an arm. You know, it, 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 don't, it breaks these couple of ways. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, I don't really care how you get your crotch into their shoulder. Just yeah. get your crotch into their shoulder like a puzzle piece. Yeah. And, um, you know, once you're there, then it just it goes that way or, yeah. you know, this way or that way. That's it. That's all you got. Like, yeah. just just find the puzzle piece that makes sense for moving the thing the way that you want it to move and they don't want it to move. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, there's that. And, um, I think that, you know, specifically to your question about, uh, you know, finding a solution that might end up being simple. I, I actually was having a conversation yesterday with Mike Isretel mm -hmm. and we were kind of getting exactly to this, this particular topic, which is number one, like, of understanding things from a systems level perspective, mm -hmm. which I don't think is commonplace enough in yeah. both the fitness and the rehabilitation settings, where you have an overarching model that explains the entire organism or you know system of systems put together as a super system. Mm -hmm. And you know when you like, so we were talking about it from an analogy standpoint, and I started the conversation by talking about like I was having a conversation with a lay person on this and you know because this guy was always asking oh what do you think about this exercise this exercise what do you think about this thing and it's like all of these like ide singular ideas that almost get pulled out of the ether mm -hmm. with like no central grounding place to anchor back to and I was like okay well look like uh here's here's how I look at at things right now like I, I see a lot of people in the fitness industry and they get really excited about hammers you know to me an exercise every exercise is a hammer and I don't I like hammers are fine I like hammers too like some of them are are cooler than others like oh this is a fucking good hammer right here this one sucks <laughs> you know but yeah. overall I'm less excited about hammers and I'm much more excited about trying to build better blueprints that would then allow faster, more efficient, more optimal construction of houses going forward, you know? And so that's what I'm after in terms of, of human development is what is the most reliable, most efficient streamlined and optimized way of being able to uh, have people learn trainable movement and then unfold this menu of trainable movement so that we bring them towards exactly the kinds of movements that will develop exactly the kinds of fitness elements that they're desiring. Mm. And it seems as though to me, everyone basically has the same starting place when it comes to learning how to do the different realms of trainable movement, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I try to take things from a principle-based approach and by following those principles, what it kind of does is it sort of knocks off the things that don't make sense inside like the collective pieces that make the logistical decisions for you. It's kind of like there's a it's almost like when I think about teaching knee dominant movements, a.k.a. like squat movements, you know, at a certain point, it's almost like uh, certain exercises get dropped off because there's parts of them that don't make sense. And when you just keep hitting these buttons of like, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense, you're just left with like this last remaining option, which is basically like a heel elevated goblet squat, you know, and, and that's like the hammer that you arrive at. But there's nothing particularly special about that hammer. It's just that these other ones for this particular job don't make as much sense from just a principle based perspective. But then I do, I like ha I go through a needs analysis on a particular person that I'm working with, and I see what they need to be able to move in the direction that they ultimately want. You know, is this a tennis player that's going to be a clay court specialist at Roland Garros, or is this a uh, you know a left guard that wants to play in the NFL? Like very different sorts of trajectories in terms of what they would need from a trainable movement domain perspective, where the left guard 
probably needs to be able to gain mass uh, and the tennis player probably needs to be able to have greater motor control in open space. And so they're both going to be utilizing squat based motions in their training. It's just that for the tennis player, it's probably going to be choices that are going to provide less feedback and that build in less constraints and that have less, you know, I just think of like the, the setup for the exercise for a football player would probably have more structured external pieces so that the athlete themselves doesn't have to like rec create their own internal uh, levels of stiffness so that other things can move relative to the stiff agents inside their body. You know, uh, the football player has external things outside their body that can be stiff and unmovable so that now they can just direct all their energy into pushing with force and that force will ultimately kind of translate back uh, if done enough times, enough force stimulus and enough exposure to that stimulus to be able to create the lifting side of the picture, uh, um, you know, uh, necessary ingredients to be able to drive hypertrophy. Whereas if I have the tennis player with very few external uh, stiff things around them, they're going to have to, you know, create their own internal levels of stiffness, which ultimately will probably reduce the pushing forces through the, you know, propulsive muscles of the body. And as a result of that, it'll probably not create enough stimulus strength or, you know, they won't get enough exposure to a strong enough stimulus to really be able to drive hypertrophy responses. You know, you obviously have to superimpose nutritional factors on top of that. But basically, uh, I, I just think that, you know, you start to see these certain trajectories emerge with more, you know, uh, frontal plane or transverse plane activities that have less supporting agents from the environment uh, with your athletes that need more motor control and less hypertrophy. And then you have more, uh, you know, sagittal and more external support for the athletes that need more of a hypertrophy uh, and just pure force, uh, particularly forces against it forces during lower speed movements yeah. uh, on the other side of the spectrum. And then other things would just fall somewhere in between. But ultimately, yeah, it's kind of like you have different trajectories of development emerge, but they both probably start and learn the foundations of movement from the same place because, you know, I, I ultimately, no matter what trajectory I want to send you down from a developmental perspective, I want you to do your activities properly. Yeah. And getting people to getting people to do things properly requires some initial first learning experience that is correct that they can then base all future um, experiences off of. You know, human learning, all learning is like an a priori kind of an experience where everything is based on something previous. And yeah. if the first thing is faulty then all things going forward after that are learned and based off of a first faulty experience. It's kind of like everything actually works that way. Like whether you're talking about psychology and like someone with like a really fucked up childhood and like <laughs> that's their go-to experiential understanding. And then like they always pick like bad relationship partners because it's a known thing and they relate that back there or just like, you know, the way that someone shoots a basketball or does a deadlift or whatever, if you can make the initial exposure uh, a well-learned thing, then you're in a good place. And if you're going to make an initial exposure a well-learned thing, uh, then you should probably start with the most simple version of that thing that you can. Like, basically, all things or work on on models you know what i mean like yeah. and you want the like the most simple model is what you're always trying to find you know if you want to understand how a human works you should not try to study it from the whole human first it's a mm -hmm. complex integrated system upon system thing that you're trying to look at you can understand how a whole human works by kind of making it a more simplistic smaller version first and like, if you go, go all the way, like a cell would be the most simplistic version. And it's kind of like, oh, well, a cell, 
digest things and it has receptors that interact with the environment and it has you know a nucleus for being able to reproduce and recreate and so like all of the same behaviors that take place at the level of macro human actually do have like some corresponding uh more simplistic thing that's occurring at the microcosmic cellular level and if you can see how the cell works then you can just extrapolate out and everything at the more complex is easier to understand because it's all just based off of the more simplistic so you always try to find the most simplistic model of the thing first and then just work outward from there and apply the lessons from the most simplistic to the now more complex as you become more and more complicated over time. That was a that was a really really good stream there because it's funny. I'm I'm a huge fan of the Russian system, and if you if you look at their development and they do a lot of research on on athletic development, they have this process of exposing the child to you know large quantities of different activities right just to get basic motor control function then after that period of time they go through deconstructing the different movements within those activities right to give them once they've developed enough right because the shape of the spine all these things are going to manipulate motor control as the kid develops right so if you start too young obviously those motor patterns are going to be completely different to when you're 14 15 um so it's funny they figured this out in the 60s meanwhile we were just figuring out and writing about books oh yeah don't early specialization but they would never ever have the child engage in serious training before these movement patterns were well coordinated well understood what what the goal and objective was out of these movement patterns um and they didn't start them too early they put them in the right place in the development and that's why you've seen a lot of these guys be successful despite maybe their genetic, uh, the lack of genetic gifts or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, there's a system there. And when we, when, this is one thing I see a lot, whether it's whatever sport it is, it's MMA. These guys are adding conditioning on before they learn how to punch, whether it's running, they're doing lots of high intensity and high volume before they can understand, you know, shank angle and where, your hip is supposed to be relative to your, to your shank angle. Um, CrossFit is a big one. Guys going out there and doing years and years of wads with Olympic weightlifting um, before they actually learn how to, to, to lift a broomstick. And to go back now and become a successful CrossFit athlete after spending, spending four or five years of you know, Olympic weightlifting within your Metcons, that's going to be a hard thing to, to reverse those, those like uh, John Kiley calls them uh, motor unit enslavement, right? You've just created this mm -hmm. deep rut that now you're gonna have to dig yourself out of, and you're probably going to lose a lot of your fitness. You're going to lose a lot of the, the attributes that you want to be gaining to get out of that hole. And yeah, I think like this book, you know, if, if people were to start you know the process with this book with even children and understanding hey these are the qualities we need to to pull if this is what we're looking to get out of but as a, as an organism in general you want to have these basic uh movement requirements uh met before we start moving off of this um but yeah yeah i just i, I just that was a really good stream because uh i think um i don't know if this is stuff you've seen with people that are already at a level where now they can't really, they can't afford to go backwards. You know what I mean? Yeah. At a certain point, Athletes. you're like, well, this is what it is. And yeah. we're going to keep it. We're just going to truck along with this. Like it would have been nice if it wasn't like this, but we're going to yeah. make the most of this, this situation from here, you mm. know, at a, you know, it's like kind of like sunk cost fallacies. Like, mm. they, well, I mean, it's, it's always, it's always tricky. It's like, when do you make the call that it's not going to get better from a technical yeah, yeah, expression yeah. standpoint? Yeah. And, you know, when do you actually try to, you know, kind of drop fitness level development in an attempt to really alter the, you know, the way in which someone does a movement. Mm -hmm. And probably I would just say like, you know, I, I um, Siddhartha Murkiji is a, is a 
doctor who's written a few like pretty impressive books. And mm. one of them is on uh, genetics. I think it's just called The Gene. And it's really fascinating. Uh, but ultimately, there's a part of it that gets into like stem cell therapy and, and, um, and cloning and things like that. And like mm. what's involved with that stuff. And with cloning, for instance, like the easiest cells to clone would be from like a embryo. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have an embryo and I've got like the stem cells from an embryo, they are the easiest. The hardest ones would be from an elderly animal. Mm -hmm. Like essentially what it was saying is that the more that the cells of a body exist in that body, like, and the longer that that body has been around, that body is taking on its own identity. That's yeah. basically unchangeable. The newer something is, the less it has an identity. Yeah. And therefore, the more modifiable those things are. You could even turn it into some other new animal, actually. Yeah. But the, so I always think like, well, how long has this thing been around for? And yeah. does it actually have its own identity? And it's fascinating because even at the level of cells, that's a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And like I said, like cells are the most simplistic model to look at. And so if you're able to understand the cell, you're able to understand everything from the whole human. So, you know, you always like time will forge your identity. Yeah. That's pretty much it, you know? And mm -hmm. the younger that you are, the less of an identity that you have and the more possible identities that you could ultimately have yeah. from every perspective, a movement perspective. Because to me, it's like a movement has an identity. You know, it's almost got a personality, an attitude, uh, mm -hmm. its own experiences, its own life. You know, if you unpack a movement, it's got its own life history. Hey, this is when I was born. These are the things that I've been associated with. These are my traumas. These are my successes. This yeah. is my story. And so the greater the story, because if you just look at older people, like older people become so patterned, you know what I mean? Like yeah. they live the same day over and over again, and they get really scared to do anything different. You know, even if their life sucks, that's their life, and it's not really going to change. They'll tell you the same stories. They'll eat the same things. They'll go to the same place at the same time. They'll interact with, they know, like they're very predictable, like set your watch to them. <laughs> You know, if they're there, you know yeah. what time it is. Yeah. So same thing. And you're not going to change that at a certain point, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it's like burnt toast. Once the toast is burnt, you can't unburn it and have fresh bread. So yeah. same thing with some, with movements. You just have to appreciate, like, how long has this been going on for? And I don't have an answer, but the more that that thing has its own personality, so the same way that you'd like try to get to know someone and get a sense of their personality, same thing with a movement, you know, ask the person about that movement. They'll have a story about it, honestly, yeah. like they really will. And the more that that story is like concrete and like they tell you highly specific things, you're like, okay, this movement has had a life of its own and it's like, it's old enough to drink and vote. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's got its own yeah. thing and its yeah. own agenda at this point in time. And I don't know if I'm really going to be able to undo this. Let me now just put it in the right constraints so yeah. that it's trained with the right amount of range of motion so it doesn't get exacerbated. And let me find out how much total volume it can kind of handle in terms of like upper and lower windows. And, um, you know, maybe over time we can do some therapy on this movement and like let the person reevaluate it and get a different sense and different perspectives on it. But it'll never be this like gigantic, complete and total changeover for that particular movement. Yeah, that <clears throat> that brought up something that, that I remember. I don't remember what Charlie Francis' book it was, but he talked about you know compensatory strategies and going about changing those. And they had different ways that they went about it. Whether it was you know some chiropractor manual therapy and stuff like that. And he talked about a female sprinter. I, I'm blanking on her name. I don't think it was Marion, but, um, you know, he'd had success with, you know, trying to reduce some of these strategies with some of his other athletes. But there's one athlete that haunted him was she was an amazing sprinter. And they went trying to fix some of the asymmetry that they've seen and it completely ruined her. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's because it went too fast. They just started, you know, 
taking things a little bit too fast rather than slowly chipping away who knows why but that always scared me and kind of brings up another concept of like um, how much is enough how much is too much I heard you you say this one one podcast I was listening to at one point where you were talking about strong enough and I heard Max Schmarzo say this and this is a constant question I hear all the time and it's funny because I heard you state a fairly simple clean answer to it and and max said the same kind of thing in a different way how strong is strong enough and it's like well strong enough is whenever they stop yielding adaptations and gains in performance from lifting or from whatever it is and you said kind of the same thing you know strong enough is where they start losing the inherent qualities that are needed for the sport um, you know what I mean? When those ranges of motion start to decrease. Yep. Um, and that's kind of a clear, and, and you, in a lot of stuff that you say, it's, it's very simple and it's so, uh, actualizable. Like you, you can take that to the bank with pretty much anything. If you're doing diligent measurement, if you're taking metrics, if you're paying attention to what's going on and what's moving, you'll always have your answer. Oh, that was, that was too much. We're not sure on why that was too much, but something I did in between now Maybe it was something not related to what we did, but let's just mark that in our heads for, hey, you know, maybe that wasn't the right way. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I think, you know, for the most part, there's, there's times where I'll just, you know, when somebody asks me a specific question and I really don't know the answer to it, I will definitely say that. And yeah. at other points in time, when there's like a very clear and obvious answer, like, I'll try to state it that way. And at other points in times, it's almost like, well, these are my thoughts on this thing. Like I was, you know, just sharing kind of like this idea that movements have personalities. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that's just kind of like thoughts on it. Like that's yeah. not like, well, there's no research I can point to. And like, and I, and I usually hope that most people can kind of understand the, the differences there, but mm. oftentimes they don't. And they're like, oh, this guy's, you know, making outrageous statements like that like this is but it's yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah. you know and but sometimes like i'll i'll like listen to different coaches and you know sometimes people will just say things that make no sense at all mm -hmm. like just none but they they like attach some level of reason to it and then it's like and then everybody's like oh okay that sounds good to me um you know, I was like just listening to somebody talking about taller athletes for speed development and mm -hmm. why bands versus sleds are a good idea. And it was like, mm -hmm. well, sleds lead to this hip thing and bands don't lead to that hip thing. And it was like, wait, what? Is that a thing? <laughs> like, I don't know if that's a thing, but it's, it's uh, just like, it was, it's like just stated, given a reason. It's yeah. almost like, you know, I'll do that sometimes if it's like going out to dinner. You know, yeah. like, I'll just give any reason that doesn't even make sense. And most people are like, oh, okay, sounds good. I'll go along with it without yeah, even yeah, yeah. thinking, you know? So it's, to me, I'm always kind of curious about that stuff. But I think that when people are paying attention and yeah. thinking about things, it's kind of like, oh, that is an obviously correct statement that makes yeah. much more sense than mm -hmm. everything else that I had kind of heard before. And, you know, the person that I first heard talk about the strong enough concept was Bill Hartman. And I remember when he said it, you know, it was like, oh, my God, I've been hearing this topic of what's strong enough for like forever, yeah. like decades. And then yeah. this dude just like said it so obviously and clearly like, well, when, as soon as the table test measurements drop below the acceptable window for the joint positions that this person needs to be able to get into for their support they've gotten strong enough or they're actually too strong and we might need to make them weaker just to see if, if they get weaker, if now their movement uh, on the table is back in the range where it needs to be for them to do their sport movements. And it was like, Oh my God. Yeah. That is the, the answer. Or <laughs> if you want to talk about it from like a quality expression, like, yeah, this person spent so much time lifting weights. Now they're like, you know, their, their distance run times are worse. You know, their VO2 is now lower. Like at a certain point, if you're going to develop something towards being kind of like a superpower, the body ends up robbing Peter to pay Paul. You just have to, there, and there's like 10,000 Peters and Pauls around the body. You just have to make sure it's not like a critical Peter 
that paid a non-critical Paul uh, to be able to like, you know, a lot. It's like, is this, this isn't really that important. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but you, you gained it, but yeah. as a result of gaining it, something else gave. And that other thing was like, actually the super important thing for your particular needs. And yeah. like there, that, that's where this like, you know, needs analysis with key performance indicators concept becomes so important. It's like, yeah. Hey man, like you got to make sure that these things don't fall out of the acceptable window for yeah. where they need to be. Um, because if they do like that, these are the things that really matter. And even the interesting thing to me inside of KPIs, you can have some KPIs that conflict with others. So yeah. as this KPI went up too high, this one kind of dropped below acceptable. And, um, and then like really the last thought I have on it, that's really important in like an area that I've found to be like just super important that just gets no love is just the idea of maintenance of fitness qualities. Mm. And so I look at it like, well, it's strong enough for now, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's strong enough forever, you know? So it's kind of like, and, and I'm just using strong enough, but it could be, uh, you know, s fast enough or, yeah. you know, agility enough or yeah. endurance enough or whatever. But, yeah. you know, so is like, you let's just go with strong enough because it's the easiest, most talked about one. Yeah. Uh, I've gotten this person stronger, like, you know, their squat, their bench press, their deadlift, whatever. Yeah. And uh, they're up to this point here. And now all of a sudden their joint range of motion is like kind of falling off the table. All right, well, I'm going to hold them at this level of strength development. And I'm going to hold them there with maintenance volume. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm going to greatly drop off, uh, you know, resistance training, but it's not completely off the table. It's just like, mm you know, let's say it's one third the volume that got this person to be at this level of strength development. Yeah. Now, as the fatigue falls off the human being and less volume is directed at this particular quality, and maybe we direct volume at other qualities and we also just allow, or we just allow this, we just train them completely at maintenance volume for all their physical qualities, you know? Yeah. And by doing that, like, it's actually like this pretty easy workouts for like six weeks. And as the fatigue falls off the system, you know, we, we kind of measure their, their table stuff over the course of these weeks. And what do you know? It's like coming back, like, oh, they're moving pretty well now. You know, now we could, let's say that like they got strong enough for that period of time, but for their sport at an elite performance level, they're not strong enough. Yeah. Okay, now we can kind of go back and bring them up to the next level of like where their next base camp is yeah. going to be through like more volume of that particular quality. Yeah. And so it's just kind of like this, you know, I, it, like, um, uh, it's funny, I, you know, I just I listen to myself sometimes. And it's like, uh, I'm talking about Peters and Paul's around the body. <laughs> but there's also like these various canaries and coal mines around the body, too. Yeah. And so you, you just have to be I think that table tests are a good canary in the coal mine sort of a thing where yeah. it's like, as soon as they start to just shit the bed on a daily basis, it's kind of like, ah, you might be creating a lot of cost right now with this, with these physiological adaptations. And yeah. those costs are detrimental to a serious degree for this athlete, for these things. Yeah. And so stop because these things are dying over here and they're just early indicators that the cost of the physiological adaptations that you're driving are potentially dangerous, yeah. you know? And, and so that canary in the coal mine analogy is, is a very apt one for physical development of athletes. Like it's kind of like, to me, it's like, you should have your KPI list, but you should also have your canary in the coal mine list. And that way you can have a better understanding of sequencing your periodized plan because before like things really become problems and you're like, Oh fuck, we fucked this person over. Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. Like, Oh, okay. Like we're starting to see like, let's be really careful here. Um, so yeah, that's just, just sort of like a, an idea that I think has been banging around in my head. Um, yeah. And I, it is probably a, a bit more scientific name than the canary in the coal mine list, but I kind of like that name. No, I, I like it too. I, and it's funny. I, 
I use a lot of technology in my practice, like pressure mapping and and infrared thermography, metabolic carts, all these things. And the reason why is because I, I'm at a stage in my life where I don't have the experience of a guy like Bill Hartman. And it's funny, I, I consult him on this kind of topic, actually, specifically. And like, I spend way too much time at the bottom of the curve and banging my head against the wall because ah, uh, what lever did I just pull there? I don't know what lever I pulled. I don't know why. And especially with endurance performance, for example, you know, whether it's a you know 10K, 5K, there's 30 minutes of time in there. Performance is performance. Yes, we should always be measuring the performance. But I need, for myself, I need to see a little bit more than that performance. The psychological factors, the motivation, the intrinsic motivation factors, all these things to tease apart all them. For me, I, I'm not good enough to just be able to say, hey, this is your critical power. This is, you know, this is what it is. I need to see more. I need to say, okay, what happened to your, your VT1? What happened to VT2? What happened, you know, thermography? Like, what changes do I see in the mapping, the way you're applying pressure into the ground over this block? Is it different than the last time? The more of these things and people are like, oh, you get too reliant. It's like, no, I'm not reliant on it. I just want to see, you know, all the factors involved just to kind of glimpse more. Cause I'm, you know, we all know those coaches that have been watching an athlete do something for 40 years, uh, you know, whether it's Olympic lifting or whether it's sprinting. And a lot of us just don't have that luxury when we're starting off to be able, yeah, hey, oh yeah, it's a, yeah, more shank, he need, he more, more transition of the, of the shin, right? Like whatever it is, oh, his hips are too low. His hips are too high. We don't have the eye, the critical eye, but what you're talking about is, you know, we have to be diligent in what we're measuring. We have to be diligent to understand like, hey, if this is getting out of place, okay, it's it's a red flag here. We got to start making more focus on what's going on, paying attention. And it's funny because listen to some people's processes. It's just chaotic. It's just like they, they're making decisions off of, I don't know what. I don't know what they're making decisions off of. You ask them, and I don't think they know what they're making decisions off of. No, they might say something, though. And, yeah, yeah. And, uh, like I was saying, kind of the, the non-attention receiver of that. Like, if you have yeah. both, you might be like, oh, okay, sounds good. And yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. wait a minute, you just bought that expo That explanation made no sense. They just literally kind of pulled these concepts out of, like, yeah, yeah. nowhere. Like, there's no central, and that's exactly what I meant. Like, there's is there a central grounding model that this person operates from, you know, yeah. that creates basically like a, a logical decision-making algorithm that has yeah. been pre-thought out. You know, if you see yeah. this, then you do that. But yeah. it's like, not just see this, but like defined quantifiably like termed yeah. in terms of certain windows of operation, you know, and, and I just think other it, like medicine works that way. Like, okay, exactly. if we see these chemicals be within these windows and yeah. relative to one another, then we use this particular protocol. And when we administer this drug, it's at this dose, and then it titrates up to this amount over this yeah. amount of time. And But if we see that, then we go this way. You know, it's like yeah. everything has got an if this, then that sort of a thing associated with it exactly. that's usually defined windows of quantifiable acceptability. Yeah. And as soon as you kind of like are aware of like, that's an operating methodology in a more mature field. Oh, we don't work that way. Like yeah, someone yeah, has yeah, to create yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, well, yeah. who's going to create it? And then it's kind of like, well, I guess I could start the process, Yeah. you know, at least in some simple way, shape or form. And then you realize like, so I, I always look at it. Like I, I learned a while ago with business related stuff, you're always looking to find the white space and yeah. white space is usually, you know, what is actually not being offered from a product standpoint, you know, uh, oftentimes in an immature field, and I would say exercise science is immature. I was quoted recently as saying exercise science is still shitting in its diapers, uh, which <laughs> I don't know where that, you know, but I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I said that it's a good line. Yeah, um, I like it. You know, I like it, it just leaves this opportunity if you like opportunity, it's a great field to work in because yeah. there's so much stuff that has not been done to make it a mature field. Like, good luck. If you're going to go into medicine and you're going to be the person that creates something new, 
Uh, sorry, <laughs> like somebody already did that like five decades ago. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, this yeah. is how we do it. Like, yeah. you're like, oh shit, you guys thought of everything, huh? Like, that's <laughs> huh. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's funny because I think about like anything, for example, that would be considered not complex on the outside, like like flying a plane, for example. There's nothing inherently that hard about flying a plane. Like the first time I flew, there was nothing inherently overly complex, but the amount of management that was taking place, the amount of different systems, they're already laid out for you. But you just had to right. manage these little levers on the systems or, or for example, like card counting, people think card counting is this complex thing. They think it's, you're literally adding and subtracting by one. If you can't do that and you can't card count, but there's a million other factors that go on with that, you know, plus one minus one process. Someone already laid it out for you and put it as system so you can learn it and you can apply it and you can gain the 1.5% advantage on the house. But you know, there's nothing inherently complex about card counting. You know what I mean? It's a simple system, but you just have to manage right. a lot of things. And that's the same with training an individual, right? There's nothing inherent like that inherently people just haven't laid at us. And that's what you're doing. Like if you it, it, like when reading your book, it's like and the same stuff that Bill's doing, right? It's people look at it from the, oh, it's way too complex for me. They're talking about, I, I just not, nah, not even going to tune in. It's, it's way out yep. there, but it's simple you just have to it's not easy it's yeah. simple but you just right. have to put your mind into it and and, and realize yeah it. it's like literally here's like just the easiest roadmap i could think of yeah. and and i call it like you know the first I, I i to me like you know i got the seven pillars of the system and yeah. to me if you just know pillars one and two i call you the mcdonald's cashier and because to me like if you work the cat, like the cash register at McDonald's, you don't have to know how much the Big Mac costs. If somebody yeah. orders that, you don't have to be like, oh, well, the thing was what, like two twenty nine, and then you punch two twenty nine into the the cash register. No, there's a yeah. picture of the Big Mac. You just hit the button with a picture of the Big Mac. Boom. Yeah, yeah. And then like you don't have to know where the beef came from or the methodology of making the buns or like yeah. the pickle farm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just hit the button. And then yeah. like, it just sends off this cascade message and somebody pulls the patty out of the, off the, off the grill. They throw it on the bun. They put the yeah. lettuce, the other shit on it. They wrap it in the paper. They slide it down the metal chute. Somebody else puts it in the bag, scoops the fries, puts them in the box. And like, it's actually like kind of, if you were to go through the entire like history of how this fucking hamburger got <laughs> assembled and, and yeah, put yeah, here, like you'd be like, oh, there's this farm in fucking Argentina and there's this shipping and distribution yeah. network that brings it to like the central place in Chicago. And then there's a local team that brings these frozen fucking patties. And then same thing for all of the lettuce and the and it's like, oh my God, the, the amount that has to go into making a single McDonald's hamburger get delivered to someone is yeah. probably unbelievable. But if all you want to do is work the register that's all you do you just hit that button and boom all that stuff's taken care of for you and so same thing like hey if you're just a trainer and you want to just pick exercises for people like that's the first two pillars and it's very easy like it's like okay we got these motor patterns and then we have like the, the way that the person stands and then the direction that they go through through space yeah. and and you don't even like so like okay we got a horizontal push in a bilateral stance and, uh, you know, it's going to be sagittal plane. Yeah. And then I come over to pillar two and it's going to be heavy and it's going to be slow and it's going to be done for a short period of time. Like you basically, it's just like, just follow that thing. And it just tells you what the exercise is. You're doing a, a bench press yeah. for three reps with heavy weights. And you're doing that because this is a, a middle linebacker in football. And they need to have that particular piece associated with their physical development. Yeah. And, and that's it. Like, and it just like, okay, well, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug in all of these movements for this particular person. And literally, if you just did that, you'd probably be doing a service that's better than 90% of what's available in fitness. Yeah. 
for sure. You know, and, and it's like simple. It's like, and it's actually just there to make your life so much easier. So you don't have to be like, oh my God, there's so many potential ways that I could train this individual. Like, what do I do? No, like, I'm just going to give you the names and the number domains that makes mm-hmm. that actually exist. And then all you got to do is just like, you know, color inside the lines and the, the movement emerges for you and yeah. just do those things. And then it's kind of like, well, sure. Like if you want to go the next step further and be like a, you know, regional manager and understand how to coordinate the distribution sites and like make sure that no one's stealing from the registers and the seven McDonald's that you kind of oversee. Sure. Like the next things are kind of like, Hey, uh, you know, movement standardization. How do I know that the exercise is actually being done right? Which could be a super complicated thing. And like, you know, people are like, oh, that's the right way to squat. And that's the, you know, but it's like, well, let's forget about squats versus like, let's just kind of standardize movement. And, uh, you know, here's, here's at least whether right or wrong, that's a different story. You know, here's at least a model to follow that is based on something that should be reproducible. And if you can now just be able to look at a person and make some judgments about where things are relative to other things, and then ask them in an interview at some point during the training process, hey, where did you feel that thing? Uh, Okay, yeah, you did that right, you know? Uh, And then it just kind of like keeps growing from there where ultimately like, yeah, you could be the CEO of McDonald's if you understand all the things and you're able to integrate them and you're able to kind of pull all of the strings from behind the scenes and uh, also get in there. And if you had to like put the mayo on the bun, you could still do that too. Yeah. That's it. When you, when you put it out like that, it does like thinking about, we'll call it exercise physiology, but just, you know, whatever it is, sport, whatever name you want to put on it. There's such a, there's such a, disconnect between and even the science itself is so messy i mean science outside of that right it's already messy enough as it is it's it's you have most people's you know backdrop of what they're doing is like accumulation of men's fitness articles um you know accumulations Mm -hmm. of key nation articles accumulations of some random bits of research and they're trying to make sense of this thing. It's it's so messy, and it creates this very, I don't want to say toxic, but it's like this dogmatic, like this this hugely gross monster that's got his rearing his head around, being like you know barbell fetishes. Oh, I have to have a barbell. What are you talking about? Yeah. You can't run a forty and blah 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 four two unless you're you're squatting, you know, with a barbell on your neck. You know, like it just it has to be this way. Um, right. And I, it's, I mean, like, if you just look at it at a simplistic view, what if a barbell was shaped like a box when we first came across it? Would we all be yeah. saying the same thing? Would we all be like, oh yeah, you have to squat with the box on your back. Like you have to do it this way, but it's like people just blindly, you know, attach themselves to these things without any, you know, not a lot of thought behind like, Hey, am, am I doing this right? I think the more doubt you have and like hearing a guy like Bill Hartman talk about the scar on his forehead, because there's a, there's always that doubt. It's like there's not enough of that, right? Because the more doubt you had, the more systems you're going to create to back yourself up, right? That that's why there's checklists when you go and fly, right? You have to check the yeah. box because inherently you, there's so much doubt of what could go wrong. If you don't check the box, good luck in trying to figure out what went wrong. Whenever right. you know your engine goes, there's the same thing with skydiving. It's like good luck trying to figure out what kind of parachute malfunction if you don't have a system of oh yeah there's a spin the lines are tangled good luck trying to figure that out in two seconds um it really is it like and you just need to lay in more constraints of like you know you you could say like like a lot of things if you're talking about automotives or airlines or something like that like i can't like there's got to be some window of how heavy the airplane can be relative to the jets that it has relative to the length of the wings, relative to like the tip to tail length, relative to the number of passengers, relative to the number of luggage. Like you you have to balance things. And for every pull, you have to account for that. And so like you have to be able to just appreciate like these windows of functionality. And if 
one variable goes outside of that window, how much does it affect the other variables? Mm -hmm. And so you, you begin to have this interrelated network of constraints that you apply over here, over here, over here, over here, over here, so that the thing doesn't become grossly out of balance and cease to function in a cooperative manner. And it's kind of like, hey, if I've got to develop a Olympic 10 meter platform diver, yeah. like this is someone whose ratios and proportions have to probably remain in this very like tightly controlled window and their flexibility needs to be like, so like the worst thing you could ever do would be to train this person and turn them into a bodybuilder, right? Yeah. Cause then it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're probably gonna hit the water yeah, yeah. and fucking splash <laughs> like crazy and not go in at the right. And like, oh, this yeah. guy can only get his arms to here now. That's not yeah. gonna work very well. Yeah, for that yeah. like it's just it's going to be yeah. preposterous but someone if they're kind of myopic or i like that word to have like a barbell fetish they'd be like yeah. well but look at the amount of forces they need to push into the board like yeah. the best guy like puts this amount of force in so we're going to just increase force <laughs> into the board yeah, and yeah, the yeah. best way to do that is uh you know uh cleans front squats back squats and yeah. uh, RDLs, and that's yeah. the entire program. Look, it's a sagittal thing. Like, and so yeah. like, well, this person also needs to fucking twist and unfold, and like go in in a perfect straight line. And yeah. now, even the fact that like their sh you know shoulders to hip ratio is different has now thrown <laughs> eighty five yeah. different other things off. So it's it is like kind of a crazy thing. But again. Like all you really need to do, because you couldn't ever possibly understand and appreciate all of those things, is you need to just have a few key metrics yeah. that allow you to stay. I love the analogy that you had of flying the plane. Like you don't need to understand all of the intricacies of aeronautics and what they yeah. did at Boeing to be able to balance all of these pieces, to be yeah. able to fly the plane. You just need to know that like this dial over here needs to like not go grossly out of the realm of like where it needs to function quantitatively or the yeah. fucking thing's going to like start, yeah. you know, spinning and it's going to, yeah. Like you just yeah. need to like keep these things in check. And as long as they stay in check, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, we're, like, it's funny because one of the things I'm seeing now with an endurance war is there's this popularization or pop popularization of, uh, you know, heavy lifting for, for endurance sport. Oh, you can't do endurance lifting. Like you, I just hear a lot of things and, oh, you got to put them under, you know, three, three rep max and all this stuff. And when you're looking at these athletes, like these individuals have never been exposed to high load. Yeah. And you're going to tell me, you're going to try and throw something in there that takes you know, several years to mass. And then this is another thing too, like with, with trying to understand raw strength capacity, this kind of dives into the Jacksonian dissolution, which you've brought forth, which I think is an amazing thing that you brought forth and kind of molded it into, you know, some of the work that you've done. And, uh, you know, as these things, like, for example, a squat is inherently complex. I was in a program the other day, I decided to go, I was going to go back to school for a bit. And they, they had this strength program because there was demands in the job that you needed to do strength. None of these people, there's like two people in the room at a 30 that had ever touched a weight, right? And okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to demand that you can squat a certain amount of body weight over body weight. And we're going to demand that you can do this with a deadlift as well. And we're going to do make sure that you hit this mark on the beep test for people that haven't lift weights. Now you're already starting off chasing something it's like fighting you don't chase a knockout if you chase a knockout it's going to be a bad day for you you're going to stiff as a board you're, you're probably going to lose the fight by decision or whatever else right you let it happen and then when the time's there to pick it you pick it um but yeah like you're going to chase these things now chase strength rather than let the strength happen along along the progress and you're going to have these inherently complex displays of uh, dis displays of strength i would call them right think about how complex a barbell back squat is for an individual that's never touched a weight in their life and now this guy's yelling at them no your shins have to be vertical you, you can't do it unless your shins are vertical and it has to be to this parallel meanwhile meanwhile one girl's got like the shortest torso i've ever seen in my life and she's folding in yeah. half to try and meet these requirements and i'm like yeah it's just 
people start off with the wrong goals in mind, I think, rather than being like, hey, let's pick these things that we're aiming for. These are the requirements of what we need. How can we display those in the simplest ways possible that are going to inherently move out all that other noise? I think about, I hit my highest squat numbers when I hadn't lifted for five years because I changed the way I thought about a squat. You know what I mean? I grew up powerlifting. I had a big numbers. And I come back five years later and I'd been running, doing all this other stuff, not touching weights. The way I changed, that's how complex it is, right? That's how complex a squat can be, right? You can do something for 15, 20 years, come back to it and changes, changes the way you see it. And um, I just think people are running around with their tails cut off, trying to chase these things that is inherently going to end up in a bad spot because you have to structure things from the beginning in a proper way. Just like we talked about the Russian system, right? If you start off chasing, oh, I'm just going to chase performance. Well, good luck. Good luck seeing how that comes right. to the other side. You're, gonna, you're just going to get the quick fix, and you're going to keep hammering on that quick fix, just like the people that start with high intensity co too quickly. Um, yeah, and it's funny because it's a very, there's just so many similar things in life. You know, it's almost like if you went out on a first date with a girl and she's already talking about getting married, you're like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> whoa that's like one. that's a huge red flag like we don't yeah, even yeah. really know each other like let's take our time here and get to know each other a little bit like jeez yeah. you know and and so very similar kind of a thing where it's like hey you know if this is gonna work it'll work but like we should probably start in the right place that's more acceptable and you know uh but i i, I do love the the ideas you're bringing up there of mm -hmm. like uh, you know, trying to jam round pegs into square holes yeah, and yeah. also like, you know, basically starting with things that are like very inappropriate start places, yeah. you know, like I, I like the similar kind of a thing I always say is like, you know, uh, if I go to the mall, I kind of know what stores I want to get to, yeah. but the first thing I have to do is establish where I am because yeah, yeah, yeah. relative to where I am is how I get to the stores. I, yeah. Like I could see JC Penny is on the map, but I literally don't know if I need to turn right or left or go to that end or that end right now, because I don't know where I'm, where I am starting. So yeah. the appropriate first steps are always based upon where you are and yeah. um, getting an accurate appraisal of where you are can oftentimes be difficult, but it's so important, you know, uh, that, that, that is really where, but I'm always going to, uh, you know, kind of, I'm going to hedge my bets. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if I don't know where someone is, I'm going to start, you know, ridiculously on the safe side of, yeah. of where they might be. And I can gradually calibrate and figure out where they are over time by ramping up towards it yeah. rather than uh, ramping down towards it. Because... Yeah overshooting is inherently much more problematic and dangerous compared to undershooting when it comes to physical testing or f development. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I've seen with like your, even your program that you have. It's funny. I, I, here's a little, how, how stupid I called it human weapon when I talked to you in the email, but the athletic weapon program that you have, I got the first few months before I was going to school there and the things just got too hectic, but it's a very you could tell the way it was laid out it's here's where we're starting because regardless of who you are this is good, probably going to be a good starting point right regardless we, we, we'll figure it out as we go but it, yeah it, even if you're just louis like louis would say ah you leave you leave some in the tank to get you know your progression you need to get some you know progression if you want to start off right at max good luck because you're going to be run, running into a brick wall pretty quick right pretty quickly um but yeah, we, like always conservative on the conservative side of things is, is always better. And that's just like with anything in life, the more conservative line you take, like, yeah, we want the competitive advantage of, of figuring out something that the next guy didn't figure out. Obviously, if we're trying to get somewhere quicker, but we still have to be conservative um, in, in the way that, we're, way that we're moving. What are you can, like- You can always get there. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. You can always get there. Yeah. Like, but if you, if you start wrong, then you're, yeah. you're just, you're, you're tripping over your feet. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, just, just take like the easy start. And then yeah. it's it, like, 
if you just look at it, like you can ramp up, ramp up. And even if it's small amounts of ramping on a consistent basis, you're going to get there pretty quick. Yeah. You know, if, yeah. if you start off too much, too soon, too fast, yeah. you know, you, you, you're going to, you know, your tires are going to fall off and you're going to run out of gas yeah. Yeah. before you even have a chance to really do much of anything. Yeah. And I think you've probably seen this too, is like, you know, I've heard uh, a few few coaches in the game say the same thing over and over again. Like, realistically, do this three times a week for twenty years and tell me that you won't get good at it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, if if you okay, yeah, do all your fancy little things and try and gain the you know two percent edge to run into the wall and you know crash and burn and do all that stuff. But like, I see wisdom in what like guys like yourself and a lot of the other guys are there in the game for the long time. It's like, Hey, there's just take a piece at a time, eat, eat your cake a piece at a time and you'll get there. Um, one, one thing it's that, just, uh, you know, I'm just reminded of the story of the two bulls on top of the hill, you know, and there's a uh, bull and a yeah, young yeah, bull. I think I know. Yeah. You know they, they look down and the young bull goes, Hey, let's run down there and fuck one of those cows. <laughs> and the old bull goes, no, Let's walk down there and fuck yeah. all the cows. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's like the, 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 they're missing the whole point of the journey, right? Like, and um, yeah, that, that, that's the other thing too I wanted to kind of get your take on is like, um, you know, how, how when, you, when you're working with an individual, like I think realistically when people look at, you know, personal training, they're like, oh, I just want to learn how to get more clients. And yeah, there's a lot of things and I think there's a lot to be said for just learning how to interact with someone, learning how to talk to someone. We all know that if you, if you can't meet those basic requirements of being a person that other people, you know, are not stressed to be around that enjoy like, Hey, yeah, come talk to my trainer after a shitty day at work or whatever it is. Um, but also what, what you're trying to get at, which I think a lot of people say they're trying to get at, but they're not actually trying to get at is getting results. And I think when, when you're looking, whether it's to get someone out of pain or whether it's to get, like, I think about physiotherapy and they have this very broad hand, stretch and strength. And like, dude, I, 95% of physiotherapists I've seen, and I've seen a lot of them, you know, they're saying this, oh yeah, you might get a little bit of reprieve from whatever you're dealing with by putting some armor around it and, you know, no receptors. Oh yeah, you're protected. Yeah. But I think what you, what you're getting at is getting results by trying to shift the underlying the underlying skeleton of someone. Like you're trying to shape the skeleton in a way which is in the long run going to get you results and I think when we're talking about, you know, what what are we doing here in the first place? We're trying to make an impact, we're trying to get the person where they want to go. Um, you know, it, like have have you noticed that like I'm sure when you started off training people it was a very different thing. Right. I'm sure it was a very yeah. different thing of what you're trying to seek out of it. Yeah. You know, again, <clears throat> I think that it's sort of like training and like, I love the flying the plane concept that you brought up because, mm -hmm. you know, if you push on one dial too much, then the other dials get affected. And mm -hmm. uh, so personal training is a lot like that to me where, you know, and it, like over time, like in the beginning, I've seen in New York, I've seen a lot of personal trainers with a lot of different skill sets and ability levels and that whole thing. But yeah. it's kind of like you have to have good enough personality. Yeah. Uh, you have to be good enough looking. You yeah. have to be good enough from the standpoint of, um, <clears throat> you know, competency with exercise. Yeah. And, um, you know, I often talk about like I've got this, this, uh, success model that i teach in the mentorship program that i do that's based on three buckets and you know bucket one is personality and charisma bucket two is uh appearance aesthetic and bucket three is knowledge skills and abilities and so with any of those buckets if you turn that bucket into a superpower you can be wildly successful very few people have the capacity or ability to turn any of those buckets into a superpower. And so you're probably better off uh, 
developing all of them to some degree. The other thing is that those buckets don't necessarily have the same time frames to them. Bucket two, that is aesthetics, has a diminishing time period to it. Like it will peak and then it will decline. So if yeah. your entire business model is based on how attractive you are, you're not going to be that attractive forever. You're going to get uglier over time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you're seeing one bucket decline, then you need to put more resources into the other buckets. Like it's kind of like, yeah. do you have like number one, you might have one bucket that's such a superpower that you literally don't need the other buckets. Yeah. But two, it's kind of like, do you have a bucket that's so problematic that it's actually like a, a cause for absolute failure? Like, mm -hmm. do, are you such a, a miserable human being <laughs> from a personality and charisma standpoint that yeah. you're just completely off-putting? Like no one mm -hmm. can stand being around you or talking to you. Yeah. Um, so that it sabotages the other buckets. Yeah. So there's there's always something to work on from any of those. They're all modifiable. Like, you know, even if you're genetically unfortunate from an aesthetic standpoint, you can always get better clothes, a better haircut and uh, take showers and, and make yourself smell good. You know, that's yeah. that's it, what what's controllable. Knowledge, skills and ability is the slowest to build, but the longest from a duration standpoint where generally speaking, no one can take those things away from you. And if you become smart enough and skilled enough, there will always be a place and a demand for you. And <clears throat> so from like a long-term development and sustainability standpoint, that's the one that I feel like is most underappreciated, but also most concrete out of all three of them. In some ways, personalities and charismas they kind of fit times and places. Like it's only good for certain environments. Like, yeah. you know, if someone's completely outlandish and, uh, you know, over the top, they might not work, work well if placed in like a retirement community where all the people are like elderly and they're like, hey, tone it down there, Peacock. You know what I mean? <laughs> but if you, yeah. it, but even if that same person comes in and they like really understand how to make a human body feel better and move a little bit differently and, and, and change joint uh, capabilities, there's a place for them. Because they'll be like, we don't care if your hair is purple. This person really helps <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's always kind of like, to me, again, like being able to identify like, okay, there's this dial is going crazy. There's like smoke coming out of the engines. The plane's yeah. going to crash because this person is you know, a trainer and they're 50 pounds overweight and it's yeah. fat and yeah. they look like they're complete slob and they haven't brushed their teeth and yeah. like gross, you know, yeah. uh, you can't, you, you can't work now because you've, you've let yourself go from an aesthetic and a presentation standpoint. Yeah. So versus like, Hey, this person's fucking beautiful and they look like they were carved out of stone, but they're, you know, completely just the biggest asshole that anyone's ever met in their entire life. And no one can stand being around them because they're all on their phone the whole time. They ignore <laughs> their client. They talk down to their client. Like, so it's, it's always just like getting some, and again, it's kind of like I have a preordained system that I evaluate things from so that I don't feel like I'm trying to look at something for the first time every time. You know, some people like have goldfish brains it's like this is the this is the first time i've ever looked at this in my entire life i have no mm. operating system or evaluative tool it's yeah, like no yeah. like i i have criteria that i've thought through that i deliberated on at some point in the past and that i'm like grading right now yeah. uh so you know I, it, there's so many areas that i feel like uh, the biggest thing that i i give as a takeaway that is a centralizing concept is the more areas of your life that seem to be important to you, you need to take your knowledge about that area from intrinsic to extrinsic and then go back to intrinsic. And the yeah. process of going from the first intrinsic to extrinsic is a very challenging one because it means that you have to actually separate yourself from it and deliberate on the topic and think about it and potentially research it and consult mm -hmm. with experts and go outside your comfort zone so that you can really learn how things work. 
so that you can have a better operating manual. You know, you talked about checklists and things like that. That's like mm -hmm. a very military based practice. Mm -hmm. Like we have operators that are sent out in the field into very dangerous, high stress scenarios. Mm -hmm. And we better have practiced something very close to the exact demands that they're going to face because mm -hmm. under the pressure of what is involved, they're going to make decisions off the top of their head. And those are probably not the best decisions. But if they make it through a mission where things went wrong, we're going to immediately debrief after, we're going to analyze the situation, and we're going to develop new practice protocols for this kind of a situation. And if this kind of a situation is encountered in the future, the operators will have practiced and understood what goes on in this kind of a thing. So now there's a rehearsed thing that is an automatic response as opposed to a non-automatic, slower, worse response that will happen if people are unfamiliar with a particular environmental circumstance. That that was a really that was a really good stream there. Like thinking about it when talking, one of the best things I learned when I was fighting was to ask people, "How did you beat me there? How?" Did, yep. and I, so many fighters would die before they'd ever ask that question, right? Oh no way, no way, no. no. Never put themselves in a in an inferior position, and because fighting is so linked to ego, right? There's so much connection there, and that's why you see a lot of guys never really progress that well. But it's the same thing that you were talking about, like with the military, creating these shortcuts, these heuristics. So essentially, whenever you come to these things, it's just boom, it's an automatic response. And I think that you see that with with most of most of the, you know, amazing athletes. When you think about like a Wayne Gretzky or you think about, um, you know, like a lot of these guys physically, yes, they, they were decent. Right. Especially like we're talking about Jordan, like but a lot of it was they already had these mental heuristics in their head for every move that oh he had eyes on the back of his head yeah his vision was really good so when he he's seen when people say they've seen things oh he sees everything he sees everything a lot of it's just that they process that information a lot quicker because they'd had those heuristics already developed in their head it's the same thing when i think about like when we're talking about fighting like if, if you think about a master fighter like someone like mayweather that has a lot of different looks i'm going to keep giving you different looks until I give you a look that I know you haven't really seen before and you're not responding well to. And then I'm going to hammer on that one because that's, yep. that's going to be your weakness. Whenever I can take you into this, you know, look that you haven't seen before and that's where the money is. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's the same with anything in life. Whenever you get out of that comfort zone, you start flannel flailing around and nothing makes sense. So it's trying to, you know, maybe you don't understand it. Maybe you think it's useless, but go there and explore it and try to figure out why it's useless. Have a reason to why it's, don't just pick up what the next guy said. And, oh yeah, because, you know, you know, I'm not going to throw anyone of us, but because Mike Boyle or Dan John or some other guy in the industry, like people cling to people. And because this guy said this, and I like this guy, I have to believe the same thing too. You know, just challenge everything that you, you come across. And that's, you're, you're the type of guys where like, there's certain guys that I see out there, like you, you can't pin them down. You can't pin them down. You think that you, you can't ever, Oh yeah, this guy's going to have this to say about this and you're way off because they yep. don't have this pattern. They don't have this thing that they attach themselves to. They just make a decision based off what they're actually seeing. And I think a lot right. of people just want to fit this mold and be like, Oh, I want to be a part of that group. And I see like all the people that you talk to, you know, every conversation is going to be different than what I would think it would be because you're not bringing all this baggage to the table. You're just, I'm not trying to be this guy. I'm trying to figure out what works and what works. Isn't this neat, you know, category of, you know, things it's, it's what works. Um, but yeah, a lot of people get, get caught up in that stuff, man. They get caught up in, and that's, that probably takes a lot of self-reflection, right? Um, yeah. You, you know, and <clears throat> It's funny, like, to me, if you, the more that you fail, and like you said, are actually willing to admit that it's a failure and not working, yeah. and like, it, the, 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 the concept of like, getting tapped, and then being like, what did you do? 
Yeah. You know, like, yeah. like switching from a butt hurt mentality to a yeah. curiosity mentality yeah. is such a big deal. Like yeah. stop taking things personally as an affront to you. Like yeah. stuff happens. Like if, if I were to die today, the world would continue to go on. Yeah. Okay. Or like, I am not a central fixated point. And yeah. that literally goes for every single person in this world. Yeah. You know, if, you know, the, 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 if, the, if the president of the United States dies today, the yeah. world goes on. Yeah. And, you know, so it's kind of like, and, and it's going to be different in that, like, what I find interesting is just sort of like, well, if something goes away and things go on, it's going to be different. And the more that something changes, the more new possibilities and opportunities open up and being able to kind of, so to me, it's kind of like, I'm always looking at like how close to being in this exact moment of time in reality can I actually be right now? Mm -hmm. And if I'm in this exact moment of reality and interacting with it completely, completely, mm -hmm. it means that I have to tune in more and more and more with all of me to mm -hmm. right now. And that's difficult because most of the time, my mind is in recall or projection. And mm -hmm. neither of those things are present. Mm -hmm. And when I actually become present, it's more exhilarating. And it's yeah. a bit like riding the edge of a wave. You know, yeah, like yeah. if you're going to actually yeah. surf something, yeah. it's scary because you're on an edge and yeah. you're right there right now in that moment. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. when you are able to actually do that, like, Things like the more that you're able to tune in in a moment, things drop off. Yeah. They drop off. Like, yeah. are you actually paying your taxes right now? No. <laughs> so stop thinking about it. Yeah. Are you actually in this argument with this person that's your nemesis right now? Yeah. No. So drop it off. Stop thinking about it. What is actually going on right now? And can you tune into it and calibrate yourself to it as much as you possibly can? And the only way to do that is literally to be on an uncomfortable edge. Mm. Because the interesting thing to me is that reality is so intense and disturbing mm. that we layer in more and more distractions because it's very hard to be in it as completely as you possibly can with whatever task it is that you choose to be doing right now in this moment at 100% of everything that you can channel into it. Mm -hmm. And so it to me is a removal of layers of distraction of things that you choose to focus on because you are so afraid of actually being you in this moment right here, right now. But every single moment in time that you are here is an opportunity to find the channel and get as close to the edge of interacting with pure reality as you, as you can possibly get. That, uh, that was probably one of the best verbal representations of something that's been in my head for a long time is like, you probably experienced this fighting and probably some of the other stuff that you do but I, I i always loved anything extreme and i was i always wanted to understand why i like things extreme I, why why do i have to do this thing so intensely why do i like this space of being like you pick something up and you can't put it down for six hours and you just you know oh you just your whole day's gone from that just picking that one thing up and and i always like i until i understood neurology a little bit better i used to call it hyper reality like when i was fighting there's just hyper reality right? All the sensory information, the smells, the sound of the cage, the feeling of it under your feet. Oh, this doesn't feel like I normally step on. Like, this is different. This guy is super, you're in tune with his emotions and his expressions. And his re he's responding so much quicker than I thought. All these things are hyper real. It's the same when, when I would get into climbing and I would push the edge and try to do, you know, stuff that was not considered safe because I wanted to find this hyper real space, you know, same with sky, all these things. It's this hyper reality of the information that you're taking in is so overwhelming. It's so overloading. There's no way you can escape it. Like highlining. I think of the first time I ever tried highlining. 
you, you know, you're slack lining over, you know, this huge abyss of a thousand feet. You have no reference of where the ground is and you're just on this line, you're tethered in, but you, you know, this thing could snap, this thing could snap at any moment. And you're trying to like find balance stepping on this thing. It's crazy. People do this with their, with their harnesses too. But I, I, the first two minutes I was on the line for two minutes. And when I got off, I literally could barely open my eyes. I almost had to fall asleep because I was so intensely focused on what was going on while I was on that line. I literally just fried my nervous system from the amount of sensory information that I was processing while I was on that line. Um, and I mean, yeah, there's a level to things, right? There's, you, you don't want to spend every day like that. But I think you, what you were saying was very, very true in that a lot of people try and escape this reality because it's too much for them to handle. And they don't realize that if they were just to maybe sit with some of those things, those uncomfortable things a little bit more, you, you would get, much further ahead you know what i mean you're cutting out a lot of the bullshit that you're going to pretend and, and tell yourself that's that's where i'm going with this ultra dogmatism towards these things in fitness even where it's kind of like i'm i'm going to cling to this thing that's kind of worked for me and created an identity for me because i i'm afraid of what it would feel like to let go of that yeah. and to just kind of be in free fall cognitively emotionally in this world that i've anchored myself in like i am this fucking guy and yeah. because i'm this guy and these things are known about me and i've created this identity and you know it's it's literally you gotta let go of it yeah. and just like interact with as close to reality as you can on a topic like yeah. Well, what's actually going on with this? Like the barbell fetish, you know, pops in my head of like, yeah. if I step back from this thing, just yeah. zoom, I zoom way back and I'm like, I'm just looking at this body kind of moving through space with the pelvis dissociating itself vertically up yeah. and down. Well, this is just a thing that goes on me. Mm -hmm. There's other things that could go on me to externally load this movement. Yeah. How much does it matter that it's that thing or that thing, or it's inside of this device or outside <laughs> of this device in open space. Like it's just another thing that's associated with the body displacing itself in this direction. Like, yeah. why am I so attached to this thing as yeah. opposed? And I have such a level of uh, contempt for that thing. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of an odd place that I'm finding myself in, you know? And it's like, yeah. why did I listen to this person who has such a extreme perspective on the way in which this thing is done it's yeah. kind of like you know love something but detach yourself from it yeah. be able to kind of swing in and out of those states and appreciate them for what they are you know it's so yeah. it's it's kind of like i always get a little bit worried i mean i like people that are uh you know so Centric. stuck in their ways yeah. you know what i mean it's like yeah. Okay, like I'm gonna appreciate you for what you are. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm yeah. curious about this, but yeah. like, you know, maybe we could talk about this. <laughs> and then you just yeah. see like someone's someone's ability to maybe instantaneously like come because I'm always curious in conversations like how close to you know us dropping off all of the pretenses and other things can we come in any instant? Mm -hmm. You know what is it? about can one of us push the other one to come into this level of interaction that yeah. is was unexpected and that yeah. like goes to a degree of connection that yeah. nobody saw coming is there because it can instantaneously happen yeah, like yeah. if we got into a car crash it would instantaneously happen oh, yeah. but does it does it require yeah, yeah. this external agent of intervention to bring us there or yeah. could one of us have the courage to potentially tune in and pay so much attention to the other person mm. or to elicit through some statement the ability to be able to get there. Because I, to me, every moment is its own universe mm. and you have the opportunity to kind of cultivate that moment to start a new direction. Mm. So what I mean by that idea of every moment is its own universe is the Big Bang <clears throat> happened in a moment. 
you know, <clears throat> and at that moment, <clears throat> it really forged like a new universe. Yeah. And so at any point in time, if you were able to concentrate enough and create a new concept or idea, that thing could explode mm -hmm. and then create its own new momentum and direction. And like, is if it continues to be fueled and continues to have activity take place around it, yeah. it can become its own world. Like yeah. someone at some point in time had the idea for the iPhone yeah. and that central singular first point, boom, it started it. And then yeah. more and more fuel went into the notion of what this thing could become. And it's literally now become such a large ecosystem of its own, but it always started with a singularity. And then that singularity can become a pen light, which can turn into a flashlight, which can turn into a headlight, which can turn into a spotlight, which can turn into the sunlight. Mm. It's just a question of yeah. <clears throat> how clear and precise was the moment. Because that moment with its origin ideas, because, you know, I, I think about this with life sometimes. Like, there was a moment at which life emerged on this planet, yeah. you know, and it comes with a fairly simple starting rule of yeah. replicate and mutate. Yeah, yeah. And then from replicate and mutate, you have all of the divergence that took place that leads to what we have now. And that's insane to think about, but it all started with, like, I like that term you use, like a hyper reality moment, a yeah. fixed point that concentrated itself so deeply with such an a beautiful and incredible concept associated around itself clean lines like almost perfection and then yeah. to me anyone can actually do that at any point in time if they were able to actually bring themselves that close to that point yeah. and that to me is what it's all about it's just yeah. that life and bullshit can yeah. pull you away from that so far that yeah. you lose sight of how actually real that fucking is. That, that was the best stream, dude. Like, I this is crazy. Like that that was the the best explanation I've ever heard for that because that's something that's stuck in my head. Even when I was younger, I was like going through this phase where I'm like, dude, I I can't talk to people anymore. I just, I don't know why we're going through this process. We have to go through this process every time. And uh, I just want to know, like, you know, and I, I just go through these phases of like, you know, just being so extreme because I wanted to get into this place. Like I was trying to push it a little bit to get into this place and I wasn't approaching it the right way. But it, it was something else you said in there about like, you know, these, the safety of, you know, living in that space. And I think that's why psychedelics are so, psychologically can be so psychologically damaging for people they bring such a hyper reality to people that they this when you when you when you look into literature and the case studies of people that have had you know psycho whether it's schizophrenia whether it's you know whatever whatever type of mental break they get this reality thrown at them that they're inherently not capable of dealing with because they've spent all this time just shoving it down you can't let that be the reality um and that's the real danger in it. and i don't you know yeah a lot of people that have those problems it's be because of and yes there is hppd and all these other things that come along with it that people should be aware of um but it's this traumatic experience it's this just like ptsd it's this huge traumatic mm -hmm. experience that's going to change your psychological trajectory for life because they weren't ready to cope with it um they weren't ready to handle it. And um, yeah, I think the closer you can get, if you look at the people that are really resilient, like if you look at when they study, you know, special forces and the genetics behind some of the psychology, uh, DR, uh, D4, DRD2, these things, like a lot of that is just they have an inherent ability to have this very, very high, like hyper reality almost like they're, they're very capable of dealing with that like watching someone's guts, you know what I mean? Like some of the stuff that goes on, right? It's so extreme, but they're, they're so able to handle that because the perception that they're looking through the world 
is with this hyper anyways but dude this is i wish we would have started here i wish we would have started here you know what i mean um this is yeah like i i didn't know where we we're gonna go today i knew i'm like i'm gonna throw some stuff out there i didn't know where it was gonna go um but yeah like this is this is the stuff i think like you know this is some of the stuff that makes change and, and people i think about being 17 being an idiot kid and i heard this one thing someone say and it just changed the complete trajectory of my life forever and i can remember that specific point to this day you know someone just saying something a little different like what you're saying um you know anyways yeah. i think I, this has been great man like um i mean yeah definitely definitely want to have you on again sometime and 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 smash through some more stuff um i know i know you're doing um you know seminars now you're back to doing seminars you got uh your courses um i know it's all linked on instagram like just give people a little brush over what they can find there and stuff like that for you yeah i mean i i have uh products that i kind of divide into two sides i have training products and education products and um the training projects are you know i've got athletic weapon which is um you know it's actually my training you know it's like but i i write the program out it's for sale. Anybody can buy it and they can follow it. It's a structured, written out, explained protocol. You know, it's, 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 it's like almost, uh, well, it's about a year and a half worth of my own training that I've mm. compiled along the way. And uh, it's gone through different blocks and everything else, you know, but it, it like, if you see it written in there, I've mm. done it. That's literally what I've been doing over the last year and a half. Mm. Uh, so and and yeah like every if you sign up for it it's a monthly subscription and there is a a new monthly you know i write it out four weeks at a time you know mm -hmm. oftentimes the blocks are longer than four weeks but i do that partly because hey here's the overall idea and then as we're going through this thing you might find out like hey this idea that i had was actually a terrible idea we're going to back off <laughs> because this is just so it calibrates itself every yeah. four weeks yeah, um, i like it and the other the other training stuff I have are the books Mass and Mass Two, which were written a while ago now. I think Mass One might be eight years old, but you know those are sixteen week training um, books, mm -hmm. and they kind of have like storylines to them, and they're you know they're they've they've created their own cult followings in a lot of ways. Uh, you're gonna work your ass off if you do either of those. And a ton of people have gotten really crazy results from both of those books. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point in time, when the circumstances are right, I'm sure I'll go back and, and run those protocols again because uh, they they always work. It's like, you know, uh, just you, you need to have the right setup and be in the right place to, to have those things really, really work for you. The other side is the education stuff. And I got a few different products there. There's the Power Hour, which I record every Wednesday at one o'clock. I've got one of those coming up today, mm. and it is a uh, one-hour education piece. I've been doing these things for it'll be five years in October, uh, and if you subscribe to it, you have access to all four and a half years worth of these things. Mm. Um, and it's just ranged in topics all over the place. Mm. But there's a lot of exercise demos. There's you know, guests that have been on there, the, the topics, just, you know, physiology, biomechanics, everything under the sun is, is in there. So um, then, of course, there's like the, uh, the Rethinking the Big Pattern certification system as well. And that is uh, a biomechanics-based um, movement model, you know, mm -hmm. and it has uh, a book a coach's guide to optimizing movement. It has a introductory online seminar. There's three in-person seminars, uh, mm -hmm. control patterns, which is breathing and core exercises, um, athletic patterns, which is running, jumping, throwing, and changing directions, and resistance uh, patterns, which is hinging, squatting, pushing, and pulling. Mm -hmm. So those seminars are all two days each. And we really kind of get into understanding the, the algorithm 
for exercise selection and competency of exercise performance mm -hmm. and how it then pertains to athletic movements, lifting weights, and basically, uh, you know, the ability to, to change your movement potential. Um, so those are fun. Yeah, it's exciting getting back out there and doing in-person seminars again in this like kind of moving towards post-COVID world. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I got, I got those things lined up. You know, I'll be in uh, Edmonton, not this weekend, the following weekend. And then after that, like, it's hard to even keep track of everything, but I know I'll be back at, on it in Texas in mm -hmm. August. I got some stuff for July. I'll be back in Canada in September in Vancouver. Uh, I've got some, something in LA in, in September. So everything's, mm -hmm. I think, booked out really until like November uh, mm -hmm. with, with seminars and all of that can be seen through like the Instagram bio link, mm -hmm. link tree stuff. Uh, if people are interested in going to those seminars, but it's, it's cool. I think that uh, I taught, I taught a seminar at, at on it in Texas this past weekend. And, mm -hmm. you know, like not everyone from on it was there, but some of the people, some of the coaches were like, man, I got to tell these other people, like they haven't seen anything like this. You know, yeah. they thought they knew, <laughs> but they didn't know. Like they really yeah. didn't know this whatsoever. Like this is yeah. very new information for us. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's the same old, same old for people. You're not going in like, Hey, this is an Olympic lift and this is a hurdle hop. And you know, this is how to hinge like, no, 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 this is, this is a different world. Yeah, no, definitely. It's funny because one of the first times I think I came across you was actually like a lecture you were doing for exercise physiology online. And it was like literally one of the best lectures I've ever seen, let alone in exercise physiology. I'm like, dude, if this guy was teaching, X fizz everywhere there, you know, there'd be a lot more interest. Like, you know, my partner, she did the king. She couldn't tell you anything you know, from what she learned. But I mean, if people like you, like, that's the big thing is who, who is teaching it is, is really going to dictate, you know, what people take a lot from it. And I think, yeah, I mean, you have a gift there for sure. Um, yeah. And all, all path stuff, anything I've come across of like the, that whole knees in for the way, anything that you've put out there, whether it's the books, um, you know, anything online podcasts, anything, I encourage people to check that out. Cause you're not going to be like coming away with the same thing every time. It's always, it's always a different story, right? You're always gonna, so, um, yeah, folks, uh, thanks a lot for tuning in today. I'll leave all that stuff in the show notes and we'll, we'll catch you later.